Hello guys and welcome to the Gozu Academy. Today we're doing a uh, yet another session. Um, last time we did, I believe, after plants and retakes. Today we are doing something that is a little bit more touchy-feely instead of being something that is very specifically, um, how can I say, it? it's it's not uh, something concrete. It's not like an after plan or retake. Um, what we're talking about today is uh, basically my path to pro. Um, how did I make it pro? What uh, sort of trials and, and what do you say tribulations? Is that I think that's how you say. Uh, did I have to go through to make it here? Um, what is my advice to someone who is wanting to go pro? What is my advice to someone who is maybe already beginning to make it there? Um, what are some of the things I've learned all my career, like across my career, that uh, you guys can learn from? So uh, first of all, just funny kind of, but yeah, we've I've, I found out that uh, I lost one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine matches in a row before retiring. So. Definitely made the right decision there. Um, going through my my sort of uh, history, as you can see, I spent almost, yeah, I don't know, something like eight years um, in teams. And my career spanned, at least my HLTV career spanned from uh, back in, uh, yeah, shut the fuck up nerd, as the team was called, all the way to Ambush, which was my last project. Um, and I will be talking basically about anything i will try to give you guys uh, tips but i will also tell you um just kind of the history behind my career um for the people watching on youtube or in the academy who are unfamiliar with my uh, career as, as a player or just career altogether uh, i kind of came up as a i guess a youtuber at the beginning doing like case openings and stuff like this and um in fact here like i was not even playing the game that seriously like I wanted to to play tournaments and and stuff, but I was not at all thinking I was gonna go pro. Um, that changed probably in this team because I found out I was actually pretty good at the game, um, and uh, yeah, that puts us to now today where I am the head coach of NIP's uh, female team, uh, a role that I've i very uh, recently taken. Um, yeah, did what? They are they are my stats here are not correct. Um, anyway. We'll just start from basically the beginning, at least what HLTV sees at the beginning. And what you will actually find is that basically, I do think these were my first maps on HLTV. Um, I uh, had actually probably one of the best best of threes of my career. Um, as you can see, my team narrowly uh, won against ESC, which was actually not that bad of a team back then. And I, I had uh, almost 100 kills in a best of three with a plus 46 and a rating of 1.6. Now, this was back in rating 1.0. Um, so at this moment, rating 1.0 with a 1.6 would probably be something like uh, a lot closer to rating of two. Uh, I, this is probably like 1.85, 1.9 or something like this. A ridiculous rating, actually. Uh, one of the best matches I ever played. Um, and uh, yeah. Basically, my first match, more or less, that I ever played. Um, this was when I started realizing, okay, hang on, I'm actually pretty good. Interestingly enough, I was playing AWP and IGL at this... Actually, no, sorry, Vesta was IGL at this moment, but later I would, I would take over the role of, of IGL. And another few uh, solid maps, um, got a chance to play uh, Space Soldiers with some familiar faces. Santaris is still pretty, pretty damn good uh, back then. He's still really, really good right now. Um, and just overall, I was kind of the star of the show, but I would also say I was having a playstyle um, that was very, in a way, individualistic. Like I was a beta uh, without really doing it on purpose. I just was. Um, yeah, short, short kind of thing. Um, actually, here in in this team, um, later. Oh, no, sorry, actually before this, I had started a team with a certain someone uh, called Magisk. Oh, well, technically I had started a team with, with a, a guy called Rizix, who I had found in matchmaking. Um, and, and this kind of uh, helps answering the question that I get, the, probably the question I get the most on my stream is like, how do I get go pro? How do I get noticed? Um, I can't say it for everyone. And, and obviously times are different now than they were. Um, but back then, 
I uh, literally found this guy in matchmaking and uh, I thought he seemed pretty good. And I just asked him, hey, do you want to make a team with me? And uh, we decided to do that. Uh, one of the guys that he recommended was uh, a, a 15 or 16 year old kid called Magis. Uh, he must have been, yeah, I guess 16. Um, obviously at this moment, like uh, one of the most decorated w uh, players of all time, like four time major winner, he's got a major MVP, had a far greater career uh, than me, uh, far, far, far. Like I'm not even in conversation with this guy, um, just to be clear. Um, and then we actually even also ended up uh, picking up to like a mixed team, a Lecro, who also went on to have a really good career, played a lot of, uh, you know, Swedish teams, uh, uh, he played also in North, like NIP, a great organization, um, still actually active, um, and has a few trophies under his belt, and that was really all it, it kind of took to get me started, was just, I went into matches, I found uh, like-minded people who I felt were good at the game and I asked them if they would be interested in playing with me and and that's uh, how it all started um, we won a tournament and I'm gonna go to Google here uh, League of Sharks 2015 but uh, we won this tournament that we played um, with this uh, mixed lineup this area sip sadly quit uh, before he went pro because he was actually probably one of the most talented players on the on the team, honestly. Um, I think, yeah, he was more talented than me, at least, that's for sure. Um, and, um, yeah, we beat Reason Gaming, which at the time, probably these names don't mean a whole lot to the majority of people watching, but at the time, these guys were very, very good. There was a Shark Gaming, a Config, definitely a player that people have heard of. Netric, I think, uh, still works as a, a um, analyst for Mouse Sports, and uh, we still have Valde, obviously, in the scene. Um, somehow we came out on top. There was some cheating controversy because people thought that Lecro uh, actually cheated. Um, ah, just touching on it briefly because it's 10 years ago. Um, Lecro was uh, playing and I know I have so many, uh, so many uh, things open here, but I'll just show you uh, Lecro cheating. You'll probably be able to find it. Uh, Basically, what happened was in this tournament that we played, you had to um, record your uh, screen with, uh, like, you had to record your in eye demo, basically. So you had to record a point of view demo as you were playing. And uh, there was a rule. And Lecro forgot to do that. Um, so we were actually supposed to be disqualified from the grand final, which was kind of ridiculous. But what was lucky was that people were already uh, suspicious of Lecro, and so someone was streaming uh, only his point of view to see if he was cheating. Um, th there was this <clears throat> incident in one of the rounds that people thought was Inky, where he looks very robotic and flicks over on the head of this player. Um, and for this, actually, especially if you watch it in slow, um, it does look extremely suspicious. Um, let's slow it down here. Like, it goes, wait, did I miss it now? I think I missed it. Um, so he goes over here, and at some point, his aim just looks like it almost robotically locks onto the guy's head. Um, and for this, we were actually disqualified. Uh, first, for lack of recording an uh, in-game uh, point of view demo, and secondly, because uh, there was basically evidence that he was cheating. Um, but I didn't accept that. And what I noticed, which was lucky, was uh, there was this thing called a net graph that isn't in, in CS2 available. But you can see your connection to the server. And what was really interesting is um, the variance here, um, the VAR, it actually spikes really high at the moment when it looks robotic and goes red, if you pay attention here, um, very soon. As soon as it becomes robotic, the variance spikes, you see, goes from 0. Point something low to 6.2, um, which means this is a server issue, or it is an internet issue from the guy who was streaming the, the point of view of Lecro. And I basically made this YouTube video, uh, got 125,000 uh, views. And uh, the admin actually agreed. Um, you know what, this guy is not cheating. And um, at this point we had won uh, the first map 
against uh, Reason. Um, and uh, yeah, basically we were disqualified, but then when the admin overturned his decision, the admin offered Reason Gaming to uh, continue the, the match from us being 1-0 up and uh, Reason Gaming actually refused the rematch uh, because they were convinced he was cheating. Obviously, Lego went on to have a, a great career, um, still active, and was absolutely not cheating. Um, but this was a very uh, sort of pivotal, uh, no, not pivotal, pivotal uh, moment in my career where uh, I actually won a really big tournament and uh, no one knew who we were. But back then, before uh, Magisk Boy became a Magisk Man, um, this was a way to uh, put my uh, name on the map and uh, become more than just a YouTuber, basically. Um, this led me actually to um, later play with uh, Dupree. Again, if people don't know who Dupree is, I mean, you basically don't watch Counter-Strike because this guy is, is also, he was a teammate of Magus for many years, is in fact a five-time major winner, the only player to ever do this. Um, yeah is, again, arguably the most decorated, uh, at least in terms of team trophies, uh, player in the world. And uh, he told me right around this time that he had, he had seen me play and he thought I had more talent than just uh, streaming and making YouTube videos. So I joined the team and I tried to uh, explore this avenue, see if I actually was uh, good. Um, and uh, I joined a team called Magistra. Um, actually a phenomenal organization to play for. Um, as you can see, I had a rating of 1.18, which was uh, quite good. And uh, mixed results here and there, but uh, we actually did play uh, quite well and overperformed, I think, even what, what people expected. For me personally, I had a lot of you know good performances and, and um, I had very um, high lows. Like even here where we lose 16-1, it was uh, hardly affecting my stats. Um, but on on maps where we would uh, you know win big, I would typically be the the guy who had the the very high ratings as well. So overall, pretty pretty solid. Um, this allowed me to go on a loan to uh, a team called Alpha. Um, I will not talk too much about Alpha. It was actually one of the I would say dark periods of my time because it started out pretty decent. Um, we beat you know Extatus. Uh, Extatus at the time had Frozen. Um, Again, also one of the really, really good players of, of now. Um, but we would lose the Dark Passage to come. Well, we would beat Coming Flames. We beat Rogue. Pretty good, actually. And then at some point, I don't know, things just uh, started going downhill and we just couldn't beat anyone all of a sudden. Um, and uh, it actually ended up with the team after three months just saying, well, we, will, we would like to get out of our contracts. This is clearly not working. Um, so, yeah. And I, I could not find my individual level of, of form. Um, we had some good players. I was playing... Yeah, there's so much history here in general. But I was playing with Cyclone, who's now the head coach of uh, Mousepots. And uh, yeah, this led me to uh, be teamless for a little while. I joined a team where I played without salary. Um, kind of on like a stand-in basis. Again, played pretty good. Nothing too uh, exciting. Um... This gave me another opportunity with my uh, good friend Psycho. I got to play with him in eFuture. Again, linked up with my uh, friend Rizix that I had started my original team with and, and played in this uh, eFuture team. And uh, put up, uh, again, solid ratings. Overall, I was, I was very um, just solid throughout the early stages of my career. Um, when we were getting into this part of my career is I think when it's, it gets kind of interesting. Um, e Future became Team One Two Three. We changed a few players around here and there. I still had like uh, consistently high ratings, and um, as you can see, sometimes for for a long time I was just uh, doing very good. Um, had a couple of, I mean, ratings above two, um, which was uh, my highest ratings at the time. And uh, I was playing really good in this team um, until we started playing some really really good teams, and then you know times got got a little tougher. Um, Unfortunately, this team died because, uh, yeah, not public information, but uh, Rizix got an offer to go to a Chinese team, and they offered him a lot of money. Uh, for us at the time, we were being uh, offered, I think, uh, 700 euros per month per player, which was an insane amount 
at the time. Like that was a pretty good deal. Like not an insane, insane amount, but like for us, that was the most we, we had ever made with Counter-Strike. Um, but Resix got offered um, 4,000 euros from a Chinese team. And um, it ended up not happening. And he ended up actually retiring after that. So that was extremely sad. One of the best teams I've ever had. Um, this is the team where I would like to start sort of talking about myself as a Counter-Strike player. Um, this was uh, kind of a mixture of some different players. Um, yeah, okay, actually we still had Rizix at this uh, at this moment. Uh, the chi China thing didn't happen and he, he started playing with, with us. In this team, I had brought over my friend Percy and my friend SMF. And we had also Maeve, who was like a pretty um, storied in-game leader. Um, and um, yeah, basically Maeve didn't want to play Counter-Strike, I think, and didn't really want to admit it to himself. So he just basically played, I think, almost one match, maybe two. And then he was like, guys, this is not what I want to do, and I'm leaving. And notice also, by the way, Yekin are bottom fracking. We had Elian, we had Nickelback, who's still active. Um, and so I think this was Maeve's last match with us, where we uh, lost to Binary Dragons. Also, Binary Dragons, like Hunter. Um, yeah, a lot of good players uh, back in the days. I think here is when we replaced... Um, Oh, well, Maeve left the team. We replaced him with Netric. Again, same guy who's uh, analyst of mouse, or at least was, if he isn't now. And this was actually when we started uh, playing real good Counter-Strike. Um, I, at this time, was um, playing full-time. Um, and in fact, I kind of left my YouTube career behind, and I left my Twitch career behind, and I uh, played unsalaried Counter-Strike for 17 months uh, full-time. Uh, chasing the chance to go pro and um i'm not sure that many people know it but actually the thing that changed from me having 0 0.64 and 0 0.26 and these kind of ratings to having 1.03 1.33 1.75 1 and above two rating and stuff like this the like what changed was actually that right around uh, this time <clears throat> I found out that I had a, a food allergy. Um, I am gluten intolerant, meaning that if I uh, eat gluten, um, I get like a stomach ache, um, I, those kind of things. Um, and it sounds kind of wild to say that this was kind of what pushed me to go pro. Um, but I would be eating um, gluten and basically eating something I was allergic to um every single day for the whole day and um uh, because my body was working so much on breaking down the gluten and trying to like get the get the body to still work i was always so tired um and i had so little energy um what i remember at the time i was competing with with uh, other good awp talents um such as smuya for example who's still now a good player um and uh, I always noticed that they would play matches and they would have the energy to call something every round, like oh, boost me here or be ready with a flash here or do this and do that. And I didn't have that energy to like kind of control the game. I think I probably had the uh, sort of possibility of doing it, but I didn't have the energy levels to do it. Um, it was actually too exhausting for me to talk that much and set up so much. And uh, after I found out that I was allergic to gluten, I got so much more energy and this energy propelled me to not only play better, it helped me have like a better focus and it helped me to take more control in rounds. And this is realistically what uh, changed everything uh, for me. Um, and that kind of can segue us right into uh, the first sort of topic that I think people overlook. It's something we've discussed here on the uh, Gosu Academy before as well, but um, I think one of the best things you can learn in Counter-Strike, and I would say as an athlete um, overall, doesn't matter if you're like sort of an esports athlete or an actual athlete, but understanding, not you don't have to understand nutrition on like a deeper level, but understanding balancing your energy levels 
is actually one of the most important things you can do. Um, I have done a lot of individual coaching uh, as well. And um, with this individual coaching, um, basically uh, what I've seen sometimes is people playing 10 facets in, in a day, um, but then they don't eat. They don't take breaks. They don't drink enough. There's a ton of things that they do that don't actually have anything to do with Counter-Strike, but that they overlook and it hurts their performance. And if your performance takes a hit, your um, sort of development takes a hit as well. Because you can imagine if uh, I am always playing at my A game, always at my 100%, I will figure out more easily, um, or, or let, let me say it like this instead, if I have consistent energy levels and I always have... Um, Basically, everything is consistent. I don't change my sensitivity. I don't change my mouse. I don't change my routine. Uh, everything is the same. Well, if I play bad, it's because um, I did something wrong. If I play bad because my energy levels are low because I didn't get breakfast, or if I play bad because I changed my mouse, or I changed my sensitivity, or my resolution, or my crosshair, or whatever, um, these are things where... After the match, I can say, okay, I played bad, but it was because I did something that hurt my performance. Um, and it it kind of stops you from improving as fast as you can. Um, so actually just figuring out sort of what was wrong with my body gave me such a big push to go pro. Um, and you can see it's, it's so many green numbers at this moment. Um, there's this one guy I played against called like Sai Wu. Um, in this match, for example, you can see I ended up winning and obviously his carry performance was even greater than mine. But I, I technically outperformed him. Um, we both had a crazy best of three. Um, and this was a, a grand final uh, to qualify for a big tournament. One of the one of the biggest I played at that moment. Super big match for me. We uh, had King win first match. Uh, we actually beat them. Um, and yeah, played played more matches. Overall played good. Um, this leads me to another really, really important stage of my career. Um, there was like a tournament where you would play against, it would be for the, for the, um, let's say the number three in Denmark to number 10 in Denmark would, would compete. Um, the best teams were too good and it would be sort of like, who's the best of the mid, <laughs> um, and this was uh, really a standout performance for me. Um, at this moment, you can see I have a very good average rating already going into this. Um, I think before this Red Reserve match, I literally had something like 1.3 average rating. And uh, we start out against the uh, Odense, which is actually, funny enough, my, my hometown, if anyone cares. I do a good performance. We play a Golden Gita, which um, I actually don't think any of these players really like made made it. Okay, Tissus made it a little bit, I guess we can say. Uh, very, very good player. Uh, forgot that he was on the team. Um, but this was like our nemesis. Um, we were actually, I would say, better than Golden Gita, but we just could never beat Golden Gita. And um, it was basically a mixed team. They didn't even practice, um, but they just played um, a super aggressive uh, brand of Counter-Strike, which was very difficult to play against because it was exact opposite of what we were playing. So we actually lose this match um, against them in the group and we go through as number two. So we meet uh, Odense again in the next match and we beat them very convincingly. We go against Frekstos, also a team with, with very good players. Bubski, probably some people know him, he's working on a desk now. We had Refresh, also a very good player. We have Dragonfly, which is, um, yeah, it sounds kind of awful to say, but Dragonfly is Stown's brother, right? So, like, that's kind of... Probably not so many people know the name Dragonfly, but definitely people know uh, Stown, uh, one of the one of the big names, uh, a multiple uh, top 20 player. Um, and we beat Frexters as well. And then we went into a grand final against Golden Gide, where I had arguably the, the greatest um, best of three of my life. And um, what is significant about this best of three is actually... Um, before this match, so I had just played Frexters, um, I guess at, at 18, and uh, before this match, I get a message 
from um, a friend of mine who was the manager, team manager of uh, Sprout. Um, and he said, listen up, I've, I've put your name in uh, with Sprout. I've told them about your good performances lately. Um, they will be watching this match. Play good and you might get an opportunity. And uh, yeah, I went on to absolutely, uh, completely dominate the server. Um, all pass was good. Cobblestone was even better. 30, uh, like 32-9 uh, on the deciding map in the series. Um, overall had a ridiculous performance. Again, one of the best performances I've ever had. Um, and from this, uh, there wasn't that much, I guess, uh, for Sprout to think about. At least that's my way of, of thinking about it. Um, shortly thereafter, Sprout removed the player called uh, Sen, a uh, Finnish guy. And I got my opportunity on Sprout, where, as you can see, it's one of the teams. Uh, it might be actually the team where I played the most matches in, in my entire career. Um, my first professional team. And that uh, brings us into the early matches of Sprout. So, um, see, this is actually not even... We're actually missing some of the early matches because... Uh, let's just do 2018. Um, at the beginning for Sprout, I was playing stand-in. And uh, my first match, I was nothing special. Um, second match, I did I did quite a lot better. I did a lot better um, against the, the Polish teams, whatever. For some reason, I was pretty good at playing Polish teams uh, back then, I guess. Um, at some point, we uh, played... The Katowice 2018 Europe Open Qualifier. And, uh, yeah, we beat uh, Royal Bandits. Um, Emo might be a, a name that uh, rings a bell with some people. Uh, this mini guy actually probably had uh, the the talent to go pro as well. Um, has played in Eternal Fire. I think he was actually quite good. Um well, yeah, we dominated them, and I had, again, well, this at the time was my highest rating ever. Um, and I remember it as clear as day, because this was the day where I um, officially went pro. Um, I had this crazy performance. I was in my parents' house. Um, I left to go celebrate with, with my parents. Um, and uh, when I came back into the team speak, uh, the coach, uh, Toby, basically told me, like, um, so the team has had a talk about it, and we have decided that we are going to give you a um, a, a contract to play professionally here with uh, Sprout. And, um, yeah, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it, legit. Um, again, I had played 17 months uh, on salary. Uh, all the money I had made, um, I had made, actually, like, a, a decent amount of money through my YouTube um, at a at a young age, and I'd spend it all uh, pursuing this dream, um, and yeah, literal goosebumps. Um, this is in my head. This this game has nothing to do with with Sprout or Royal Bandits or about my performance or anything. Um, I I whenever I see this match, I think the contract game because this was when I went pro, and that's just an unbelievable feeling. Like um, like sort of working so um directly towards one goal um and and i had put a timer on myself i had given myself one and a half years um basically uh so when i played 17 months uh, on salary my my timer i put on myself was running out i was gonna go back to just a, a regular job like go to university um and uh yeah this changed literally everything um now more than six years later, I'm still here working with Counter-Strike. I haven't been back to university. And, uh, yeah, a very special game for me. Um, very, very special game. Um, nothing super special happened. We definitely didn't make it through this tournament. Um, but a very, very special match. Um, one of the most special for me ever. Um, yeah. Um... Instead of it just being me talking about, like, there's so much history and I could talk about this all, all day. Um, I want to try to talk about some of the things that I think I did right here before going pro. Um, I mentioned it already, but I just want to also kind of conclude on it and also bring up some more things that are important. 
um, if you are trying to go pro, when you play face it, when you play matchmaking, when you play whatever you play, try to find like-minded people um, that you like to play with, who, um, yeah, just you enjoy playing with, but who also um, have the talent, but also have the same kind of ambition as as you. Um, Rizix, for example, he was very clear he wanted to go pro in Counter Strike, and that's why I wanted to play with him. But if he would be really talented, because when I met him, he was better than me for sure. Um, if he would have just said, yeah, I'm just doing this for fun, I likely wouldn't have started a team with him because that was not what I wanted to do. Um, a lot of people come to my streams um, and also here at the Gosu Academy and they ask me like, um, what can I do to go pro or what can I do to get noticed? And it's like, just find like-minded people and start a team. Like, um, I was a little bit lucky in a way that I had some kind of big results early on. Um, but I was also unlucky because because I was a YouTuber before, no one wanted to believe that I was actually good at the game. Like uh, the first two or three years of my career, it was all about shedding that negative reputation of being a YouTuber. Like if people would lose to me, it would be like, oh my God, we lost to a YouTuber. Or if I would play good, people would be like, whatever, it's like, uh, it's just a YouTuber. Like he, anyone can have a good game, you know? Um, it was so hard for me to shed this and, and Danish teams wouldn't want to take a chance on me. Uh, people were making fun of me. Um, it was actually like, uh, I felt kind of bullied out of the Danish scene. And it's why I also, my first professional team was a, was a, was an international team because no one wanted me in the Danish scene. I so long had, had performances that were good enough to give me an opportunity to play for tricked or something like this. Um, but they wouldn't give it to me. They just they refused. And I had to go so deep that I put up performances to the point where I got sort of internationally noticed um, for me to get a chance. Um, so part of that was find people who are like-minded and work hard. Another part of it is one of the best things you can do for yourself is finding a team and um, learn how to play in a team environment. Uh, I could not tell you how many people with over 3,000 ELO I meet and face it, and they are literally brain dead. They have no understanding of team play. Um, they play for themselves and they have great aim. And there's a reason why they are at that ELO. But it just does not translate to a team game. Um, it's nice to have that one guy in your team who just is an insane aimer and kills everyone. And it's it's extremely fun to be that guy who just has no brain and kills everything. Um, but one of the best things you can learn is actually playing in a team and understanding the game at a deeper level being challenged um losing matches and going through them and being like oh, what could i have done better here and getting other good players uh, opinion on that or maybe even having a coach um these kind of things uh they're important and um there were some of the things that that helped me a lot um I think, and I touched, I think on this last session as well, but one of the, one of the advantages at least I had in my career was I was always very goal oriented. So, um, it was for me, like, I know I want to go pro. I'm going to put all my energy into going pro and I'm going to do it by doing this every day. I'll do one hour of deathmatch every day. I will do X amount of games. I'll play this amount with my team and I want to be the top of the scoreboard every game and I blah, blah, blah. Um, super goal oriented and um, it did pay off in the end um, but when people say how do I get noticed how do I go pro um, all it takes is one good result you know like and if you have a match in an open qualifier or something where you pop off and you destroy um, individually you have a good performance against a, a team that people have heard of people will see your name it's as simple as that if if you have a team that is beating another good team and you're one of the good players on it, you will be noticed. Um, there are players like, uh, yeah, what would even be a good example here? Maybe even I'm a good example. Well, I was performing far above my teammates and I feel like, honestly, even looking back at it today, I should have had the opportunity to try out for one of the good teams uh, a lot earlier. Um, but I just didn't get it. And... Um, even though I had like an individual good performance, there are a ton of teams out there where it literally is a team that comes up. 
like uh, even just if we take basically the world's number one right now spirit um that the bookmakers have as, as a, a winner like a, a favorite to win the major well this team um mere months ago was not a team you would even probably consider as a top 10 team um there are teams like let me see, for example copenhagen flames um is a good example from the danish scene um you had a team of of people who had never made a major you had uh, you know nikodos you had yabi you had hooksy um yeah i actually don't even know who else they had anymore maybe someone can help me uh like going flames at the stockholm major well yeah exactly i've completely lost the uh, oh, like it was nikodos yabi uh had that one guy with a really Huxi. long name what was his name I feel like they all. Oh, they had Roy as well, of course. Had and then Roy, some... Siphon is his name. Siphon, thank, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah. So uh, these players, for example, I mean, they were not even in the Danish scene seen as people who were all all that. Like uh, some of them had talent, right? Where someone like Roy, he had good stats. Someone like Nikodas, he had, he had great aim, but he was very raw. Like he was. Nikodos was known as a guy with crazy aim, but had no brain in the Danish scene, you know, and they make it to the major as a team, and now, basically, they all got a shot at playing pro, and, and Nikodos uh, has found himself in a good team, Huxi has found himself in a phenomenal team, um, has won multiple big trophies, and actually, Huxi was the one that people probably figured would be worth the least. He ended up, so far, having the best career of them. Um, what I'm trying to say with that, and this is one of the best things I can give you as advice if you want to go pro, is you don't even need to be the best player on the best team to get a chance. All you need is a, playing in a team and doing a couple of upsets. And it doesn't even matter if you're not the best player on the team. People will hear your name. And if you are, for example, an anchor player, but you're playing for the team and you're starting to upset teams and stuff, you will get a chance. The same... Um, Spirit are playing right now. Uh, I believe, uh, no, they're not because they're just too good. But Suntix, for example, I mean, even here, he isn't like the guy who, in terms of roles and stuff like this, um, should be set up to be the star. And yet, still, he's playing on basically the world's number one team at the age of 18. Um, this is not because he had like crazy good stats, like Donk, for example, had. But it's because he played extremely good in his role in a team that proved they were better than the level and he got a chance to play at a better level and now he's proving at the better level he can keep up. So don't be so focused on like... Um, I think another example actually is like a guy who hasn't made it yet is a guy like Art Frost, but everyone still knows who Art Frost is, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like he was the Opal of Spirit Academy and he's, everyone's basically like, yeah, this guy's nuts. But yeah. he doesn't have a pro team yet. Yeah. There's a million, there's a million like that. Uh, not everyone gets the opportunity at the same time. It doesn't mean one is necessarily better than the other. Um, but the point is, at least, if you just play for a team that does results above their level, you will eventually get a chance. Like people recognize, okay, this team didn't get here if, if, uh, if someone on this team just completely sucked, right? Um, or maybe they do agree, okay, there's, this one player was really bad and they still made it that far, you know. Um, so yeah, best tip I can give you, start playing in teams early. Um, work hard, work uh, committed, do everything in your power to reach your goal. Because I also think a lot of people, they will come to me and they will ask me like, um, what can I do to get better at the game? And I've probably also some of you have heard me say it before but it's like such a lazy question because it's like you've literally spent zero time even considering like what could make me better it's so unspecific if someone will come to me and say hey how can i be better at anchoring a noobis a site then i can be like yeah so you can use this smoke you can do this you can do that if someone comes and says how can i get better at the game it's like everything you can get better at aim, you can get better at decision making, you can get better at communication, you can get better at playing around your teammates, you can get better at carrying, you can get better at uh, whatever, you know. Um, you can literally get better, even if you're the best player in the world, you can get better at everything still. There is no cap. So asking how do I get better at the game is just such a lazy question because 
uh, you have done zero of the work yourself. You're just expecting someone to tell you something that will just instantly, like, like a, like a flick of the fingers, make you better. And no one can do that because if it was that simple, that someone would just say, like, "Hey, how do I get better?" And I would say uh, three random words like uh, "moose jaw smoothie," and that would make you instantly the greatest player in the world. Then everyone would know this. If that makes sense, like, I cannot tell you like yeah to get better you just have to go do this aim routine and stuff like that because then everyone will be doing that aim routine like you have to make that work yourself as well um and it's good to ask for pointers but be more specific what do you want to learn about do you how do i get better at supporting my teammates um that's also pretty hard it's very general but at least there i can say something like yeah you should take a look at your teammates and try to play around them and be ready to flash in the back and offer grenades and I can give something at least but yeah if you just say how do I get better no one can answer the question no one um, another really um, key match in my career we played against um, actually uh, a team that had just uh, played really well at the major had, had surprised everyone no one it was actually a, a really good example of this as well no one knew who these players were and funnily enough, basically four of them kind of never made it. Like, Quick was, was uh, I guess, kind of, uh, what's it called? Like, he was uh, he was close. Let's just say it like that. Boomich, obviously, extremely made it. Um, won a major. Everything. The IGL of the team. Um, but these other players didn't make it. But as a unit, they were good. And they, they did get some kind of chances to show their worth. Um, basically... They had just come off of a great uh, time at the Major. And uh, I'll see if we can... Yeah. So basically, just on this cobblestone map... Um, we ended up in a... Uh, well, I ended up in a 3-on-1. In a 1v3 one, one it is. Pistol round. Uh, and uh, I won it. And then... Later, this was what I think really put me on the map early on as like a player. A, a simple P250 in a 1 versus 4. They have full, like they have two orbs and MP9 and AK. I have basically nothing, not even Kevlar. And uh, yeah, this is one of the one of the most important highlights of my career. Individual highlights. So, you see, this was one of the things that I was extremely good at at the start of my career. Very thorough. Checking all angles, jiggle peeking everything. Because I don't know if someone is here. And what was, um, how can I say, very um, important for me at this stage in my career was, I always gave people the opportunity to make a mistake against me. Like, if someone was actually here now... Uh, he could miss, and I could go out and kill him. If I made noise here stepping, I want to see if this guy makes a mistake on me. Now I realize, okay, I guess no one is even here. So, I go closer to the orb, but as you can see, again, still very controlled, even though it's a pretty pressured situation. 20 seconds left. I prioritize the bomb plan, because yeah, I was not expecting to win this uh, round, and um, yeah, this... Uh, Highlight got got posted on on different uh, sites. I miss a shot. It's really a hard round actually, coming in from all three different angles. I get this kill, and all it takes for me is actually seeing this guy jump across the platform to know that this guy is running this way and this guy is running this way. So even though normally when you have an orb, it's like a kind of static weapon, I do like really smart pathing to go around people. I get the kill here on on Jimka. And now I check left side to see if he's pushing me on this side. Since he isn't, I'm assuming he wants to take the fight. I ready myself and I kill him and I win a one on three. Um, if only this was in CS2, I would have won the match by now. But yeah, we had a few more rounds to play. But uh, this uh, highlight was kind of, I think, what put me on the map. And, and this match, beating a team that had just had a good showing at the major, very important. Um, moving on. Funnily enough, I played my old team. We almost lost. Um, 
had another kind of important game towards the beginning of my Sprout career. Um, I see it, but I want to see if there's something else uh, before it. I uh, don't think there is a whole lot. I mean, you see, there's many good performances here at the beginning. Overall, I was actually playing really solid uh, at the start. Um, here, really important match. Sprout, a German organization. Um, winning in Germany meant so much to them. And the first, like, derby we had against Big, which was like the... It was literally like the big brother um, to Sprout. Like, not... They weren't affiliated in any way, but Big had more power, more money, and a better team. And uh, I top ranked. Um, we beat them, and uh, the Sprout management took us out for dinner. Everything paid. It was very nice. Then, uh, what I argue is my best individual tournament of all time. Um, started out against just a mixed team. This is Copenhagen Games. Played against Ignite. Super scary match, actually, against some pretty bad players. Um, I think if I check this, no one has heard about these players, basically, like... Okay, Nodius is now at his first major. I, actually, we played against Lucky, but I think he was like 15 at that time. And then I guess maybe uh, Vesex was there, maybe Kia. It's like... Some people didn't make it, some people had an okay career. Uh, some people have more to do, obviously, because they're still young. Played against the Estonian team, almost lost this one as well. It was crazy close. Played against Red Reserve, pretty decent team. Had some good uh, Swedish names at the time. Um, I think it was like Disco Doppler, Freddy Frog, Relaxa, Boten, Plesson maybe? Maybe DJL. I think DJL was probably there. Um, recent main coach of NIP. Uh, and then, with this Red Reserve match, we, um, I think again, I had a pretty good performance. Uh, we made it to the main tournament in Copenhagen games um, and here we met a heroic um, this together with the golden Gita best of three is, is likely the best best of three I've ever played um, a 1.5 rating basically in a 2-1 uh, against heroic which was uh, I think like a top 10 or 15 team um, on yeah on land um, and uh, against the Danish team, um, I had a crazy all pass that we won very close to even keep us in the game. Um, 1.66, one of the best maps of, of all time for me. And then we just destroyed them on the rush. Um, there is an asterisk. Um, Isatek, I think, was playing up because I think Yuki had just left the team. So this was not actually the real heroic. But uh, I did get to shake the the hand of Kasper Witt, who was uh, the, the director of sports of Heroic and of Astralis at the time. They were owned by the same company. And um, something that is not public knowledge is that this was in March. And in April, uh, Heroic uh, approached Sprout to try and buy me. Um, two months into my contract. Um, I went to Copenhagen, um, got a tour of the facilities. I had a personality test. I had a conversation with them. Um, they were inquiring about my buyout and my buyout was about $100,000. And um, Heroic thought that that was kind of too pricey. They were looking to pay, I think, maybe more like 66K. And what I offered actually was that the remaining buyout um, I would pay off with my own salary um, from Heroic. So every month I would get a lower amount, but it would help pay off my buyout because um, I really wanted this opportunity. And uh, Sprout basically said, Heroic, you have 24 hours to respond to our offer. And Heroic, which was a part Astralis as well said uh, no one can tell us <laughs> kind of what to do and so Heroic didn't answer on time and uh, Sprout just decided to shut all communication down with Heroic and um, I didn't go which is why it was never public knowledge um, I kept it to myself this was actually a, a little bit of a tough time period for me because I had a big offer and I didn't get it um, but I, I decided with myself I wanted to remain professional and um, 
keep trying my hardest every day and just play good and sprout. And uh, so it continued. Right around here is when we make a couple of moves. Um, I brought in Cyclone, my good friend. I brought in Percy, my good friend. And uh, this Danish version of Sprout was actually the best Sprout team I played in. Um, my ratings go way up because we're winning more. My teammates are, are better. I'm having more fun. I have a best of three here, for example. We have to qualify for a land in Paris. Uh, I just uh, completely clap the other team. Um, Maka, for example. Lucky, pretty decent players. David P be, like went pro in um, in Valorant as well. Um, keep moving forward. I had this best of three that I lost against Windstrike. Also uh, like a, a big carry performance. I had just many uh, good performances in this team. I'll, I'll skip the kind of uh, useless stuff, but uh, right around... I, yeah, actually, when was this even? Is it? No, it's not here. Here it is. Um, basically, uh, actually, this is kind of interesting. So we, we played the qualifier for, uh, the minor and we narrowly win against Vindigo in our first match. I didn't play good at all. My teammates carried me. It was amazing. Thank you, teammates. We played red reserve, uh, and I think I returned the favor. I had a really good performance. We play against Kingwin, uh, and we lose. And uh, we were 2-0, and we needed one win to qualify for the for the Europe minor. I played pretty decent, but it's whatever. We play Enns, and we uh, basically don't have a chance. Like, they just smash us. This was the Enns team that, like, basically... Uh, is the, actually the exact Enns team that went to a major final uh, about seven months later. So... This ends team had a lot of potential um, at this moment. We got smacked. Uh, we didn't have a chance. So now we went from 2-0 to 2-2. And it comes down to the last match. Um, and uh, yeah, we won it. Uh, I didn't play that crazy on cash. But what I do remember on Mirage was I had 25 kills. And I think... Uh, on Mirage alone, I had 21 kills with AWP. So out of my 25 kills, 21 of them came with AWP. Um, I was uh, like uh, dominant with AWP in, in this match. We ended up winning. We ended up qualifying for the minor. One of the most... Uh, sorry, this is not the minor. Uh, we are at the minor here. Opening matchup, King win. We, uh, we win it somehow. No idea how. Second matchup to... It's winners match in the group. We beat NIP in overtime. Uh, and we actually go through as number one in the group. Which means we have two best of threes. And we need to just win one of these two best of threes. And we qualify for a major. And get stickers in the game. First best of three. Play against ends. Again, get clapped. We have no chance. They're just way too good. Second best of three. Play against NIP. Legendary lineup, people probably know. Uh, well, not the legendary lineup, but definitely have some legends. Forest, get right. We actually have Lecro here as well. Um, rough, rough match. Basically, get completely carried by Percy on Rush. There's only reason we even got a map. Uh, nuke, horrible. Um, train, very close. And uh, we lose. We're out. We don't make the major. Sadly, in my career, I never, never ever made the major. Uh, this was the closest I came. Two chances, needed one win, and, and lost. So, yeah, not very uh, nice. Uh, still hurts. It's a pretty hard uh, lineup, Ents and NIP, though. Yes, exactly. But <laughs> this was like the level. These these teams didn't even win the minor. Uh, it was actually the Danish team Optic that won this uh, minor, if I'm not mistaken. No, actually, so NIP won it. Optic got second, and, I mean, and Ents didn't even qualify. I mean, that's also the NIP lineup when Res was really, really good, right? So it's like not... Yeah. Not, it's not just like the retirement home NIP. It's like actually like pretty yeah. some good young players in that team as well. Yeah, they, they were good. They were good for sure. Um, go on. Uh, this is when I think also my... Like this is 
yeah, I don't know if it's it's important for you guys. It's it's a very very important part of my career. Uh, we become a German sprout, basically. Um, I would say some moves get made behind the scenes. Actually, this is kind of also important. Uh, basically, just we uh, go against Euronics. Uh, Euronics was actually a pretty decent team. They had Faven, uh, plays for Bleed right now. We, they had uh, Kasuya, Crispy, like good support player, good IGL, very uh, new thinking. Cressy was actually a, an up and comer as well. I, I don't understand how this guy never got a career. It was actually really good. Um, Mirbit as well, played for, for Sprout, actually replaced me in Sprout. Um, yeah, uh, anyway, um, we played with Maniac, who was retired as a stand-in, and we played with a 17-year-old guy uh, who uh, no one had ever heard about before, Sink D, uh, and we won the German Championship. And I had a really good season, the whole season, and I had an insane final, and who do you think got the MVP? This guy. <laughs> For whatever reason, the the German Championship uh, organizers decided that the stand-in that we had, who was... Um, it was not that he was directly bad or something, but I guess they wanted to make it more like a feel-good prize. They gave it to him. Uh, he got a whole ass trophy. and Yeah, he's a really nice guy. I love him, David, by the way. Still good friends with him, so I've got nothing against him. And David did good uh, also in the final, but... Yeah, I wish I would have had like an, an actual MVP trophy uh, to put somewhere. Um, anyway, uh, moving on. The last of my Sprout time sucked. Right around here, I find out, like uh, in month nine, find out that Sprout is looking to replace me. That I am almost 100% out uh, in December. Uh, then come December... I'm driving to the German Championship, and as I'm in the car, driving to the Championship with my dad, I get a message from a certain someone on Twitter saying that uh, Sprout have removed me from the team, but they haven't told me it, and they already have signed new players. So I go to this tournament knowing that I'm kicked, and we fail. I actually played, compared to the other players on team, very good, but uh, yeah, not, not nice. Uh, it does bring me to a really important part though, and it's uh, something that is a little bit hard to talk about, but I've been wanting to make a video about this for the longest time, I just can't do it, <laughs> but I will at some point. Um, like, I've, sh I've shown you so many of my good moments, and I've told you like how much it still means to me, that one match where I went pro. And I can also tell you guys that it means so fucking much to me this period of my life. Um, I, my personal life outside of Counter Strike was horrendous. Um, I went into a deep depression. Uh, I got kicked from my team. I uh, broke up with my uh, girlfriend at the time of four, almost five years at the same time. Um, literally like on the 26th so five days after the last match i played for sprout uh, super deep depression uh couldn't even get out of bed uh for four five six months um because i wasn't good enough for sprout and um yeah my relationship on the outside was not going good um and uh this is why you basically don't see me um, play many matches at the beginning of of I I uh, I got asked to stand in for heroic uh, and I played with some friends and then I went to Copenhagen games for the good vibes uh, and then I played for heroic again but there's a big gap here where I'm basically not playing the game like uh, I I don't like the game uh, heroic asks me to stand in and I say yes obviously and I'm really happy and I play good um, and uh yeah but uh, full depression full depression heroic comes and asks me uh this is six months no five months later and uh yeah i wanted to say no because i was uh, depressed legit five months later still depressed uh but you don't say no to heroic and such a big opportunity so i said yes and i played like shit 
or well at least I didn't play good. Uh, we had some of the most big wins of my career. We beat number four on LAN. Um, we qualified for Pro League finals. I was living the life, but I was playing like shit, and uh, and I was feeling like shit. Um, and it's also why, you know, things were getting better. And what is actually really sad, and it's easy kind of to say, but uh, right around here, after getting home from Cologne, and before going to Chicago, um, I um, started actually doing the first do like basically something happened that that unlocked myself again. Um, I I yeah I unlocked myself. I I was starting to get out of my depression at this moment, and uh, in the first uh, best of three. Chicago, we win, and uh, yeah, okay, I, I was doing better, like I had really rough roles at this time, I was playing like super, super bitch roles, basically, we play ends, extremely close game, uh, and I perform really good, honestly, um, we play against uh, Vitality uh, again, as the decider, where is this match that I'm looking for, this one, I don't think I do that great, but I don't think I played that bad either, like, uh, Isatek had taken over my AWP at this moment, so I'm playing, like, bitch rolls. And he had a really rough best of three. But at this moment, I'm I'm starting, actually, to play, like, a... Um, like, I'm good enough for the team. And uh, this was my last event with Heroic. Um, so that was pretty sad. Uh, and uh, I've since been told, because they replaced me with Bob. Um, and... And... Uh, Freiburg decided to leave the team, but he only told me, he didn't tell the rest of the team. And um, I have heard from the team that if if they knew Freiburg would bench himself, they would not have removed me. Because we were the two support players, and if they would, they only needed to get rid of one. I was the, the easy option, in a way. Um, I was also probably the, the, the worst player at that time, right? Um, so it was fair enough. Uh, but, yeah. Things could have gone differently, it's whatever. Uh, I play some standing for Coming Flames, I play some standing for Nordavin, uh, and again, like, literally, I'm just still not feeling that great. Um, actually, right after getting removed from Heroic, I meet my current girlfriend and fiancé, and things uh, start feeling better. I, I'm, I'm feeling better, just... Um, I'm sort of out of depression. Then... Mouse comes and asks me, hey, do you want to stand in for this uh, tournament, uh, CS Summit? And uh, I say yes. And yeah, this is a fucking insanely weird tournament. Like, look at this mishmash of like like decent performances, but then trash because we lose like to G2 in a best of three. We lose 16-2, 16-3. And then we meet them in the final and we win. Um, probably you guys know the story somewhat, but uh, short, short explanation. Basically, Kerrigan. Uh, and Mouse. Well, I was even there in the first place because Voxic, the AWP player, couldn't get a visa for uh, America in time, whatever. Uh, he's from Turkey, it was a little bit tough. But Kerrigan needed to go and get a visa for Russia because they were going to play Epicenter, which was... Um, Summit was like 100k tournament or something like this, 150k, and Epicenter was uh, 500k or something like this, 300k. So that was more important for them. And... Um, Kerrigan literally had to leave in the middle of the grand final to take a flight to get his visa for Russia. Um, so we played with the coach, and uh, the coach had a rating of 0 0.07, and I also sucked on, on single map. Somehow, and I don't know how, with the coach and without our in-game leader, we actually won the last map, and we won the tournament. Um, my only ever big trophy, so to say, one that is on my profile. Um... Yeah, crazy stuff. Um, I will move a little bit quicker. I move into Nordavin. Uh, this is more of the same. Uh, I was a pro. In fact, Nordavin was where I was getting paid the best out of any team ever um, in terms of monthly salary. Uh, I was sort of living the life, but uh, just as I joined the team, basically, kind of what happened with Maeve earlier, uh actually already here holy shit like look how few matches we have 
I sign like a contract. And yeah, holy hell, wait. So we play one day with Rubino as IGL. And Rubino is still here. And like just a matter of days later, our in-game leader uh, basically decides to quit the team. And we don't have an in-game leader. So I end up being in-game leader and HS was in-game leader and back and forth. And it was horrible. And yeah, just six months of not having fun. Because this was just not a nice team to play in, in my opinion. Um, funnily enough, we actually uh, go on summer break. Oh no, we, right before going on summer break, we do win a tournament. Uh, Melta Vibes. Uh, we we came out on top. I had the highest performance or like the highest rated performance. I mean, it's kind of normal for an AWP player, but whatever. I think even on those two, I I don't know. But either way, um, we won this tournament, and then shortly after the summer break, I got benched. As you can see, like come back from summer break, play like what five matches or something, and then they kicked me. It was uh, weird, but good for all parties involved. And then some standing in with complexity. I, I won't touch on this too much because uh, I, I, I think it will be too crazy. I go to Lumbi Vikings uh, to try and reignite my... You know you know what actually... What's actually interesting here is... After this complexity thing, I'm thinking I want to reignite my career. I want to take a sort of step down. And I want to be the best player on a team. And I want to show the world how fucking good I am. And I play... Um, for like a full month um, I think at this moment um, because an organization says that they want to sign a team I was playing in and then basically on the day we were supposed to sign the, uh, the organization says uh, actually they didn't even say anything they just they stopped responding to us so then I, I started playing in Lumbi Vikings and it did go pretty good I had really good performances against many good teams um, got some very exciting highlights uh, as well. And then uh, I leave the team because, uh, yeah, it's whatever, honestly. It's not even that important why I left, but I decided to do it. Um, I got an offer from Guilas. Um, and yeah, that was also kind of a shit show. Just this, this team, it had a lot of uh, players who actually had done a lot, but there was just no motivation for people to try and win. And it was just not a good project. Uh, I think everyone knows from the outside as well. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, another complexity. Then in 2022, I uh, play with Finest. Um, they actually uh, said they would give me a contract. And on day of signing, they said, uh, actually, no. Um, so, yeah. Then 2023... No, actually, end of 2022, right around here, I have a new organization, day of signing. They say, uh, actually, no. Um, it happens like three or four times within like a two-year span or something like this. Um, the reason I'm telling you this is because it's not something I've really made public. I want to make a video about it one day. But the reason I'm telling you this is because people from the outside think that being a pro player is... Uh, a nice job and it's so easy and um, you get paid loads and you get to travel the world and you can get girls and uh, you can whatever um, the reality of it when you are on the inside and take this from someone who's been through it is being a pro player is for the most part pretty shit if you are playing in a tier 1 organization or if you're playing near the top life is fucking great like you're being paid loads, um, you are traveling a lot, you are um, hopefully, you know, winning a lot, you are playing exciting tournaments, you get treated like a superstar, um, getting nice hotels. Um, for example, we went to Pro League Finals. We were there for eight days in uh, the southern of France playing, right? And after four days, the tournament goes to playoffs and we lose out on it in the last match. Uh, so we just have four days of vacation in the southern of France. Like, this is a dream, you know. Um, but if you're not in a top organization, 
it's a whole lot of organizations offering you things and then removing it again right under your nose it's a ton of backstabbing it's a ton of um yeah it's a ton of for example uh yeah now i said it but in sprout for example i found out that i was being removed from the team um by text message from someone who has no relation to the team when i was in heroic i knew it already 10 days before they benched me but they wouldn't tell me um and i also got a message from the same guy telling me bro i hear you are out of heroic when i didn't even know it myself cs is uh, ruthless and it can be horrible um so keep that in mind before you sort of make your whole life about CS. If you're young, you're a talent, you're playing in a, in a good team and stuff like this, life is amazing. But if you have that drop off, or if you don't get the offers, or if you do get screwed over by your organization or whatever, like even this Gorillas team, for example, it's public knowledge, so I can easily share it. They scammed the players out of uh, 200,000 euros. And I'm still pretty sure these, these players never got their money. Um, I can tell you uh, at a later time for another organization. So actually I got removed from Gorillas and I got my money and I got out, which was lucky in a way. But at a later time, I actually do um, sign for an organization that also do some, what I would say, borderline illegal or maybe illegal stuff. Um, and it is just part of Counter-Strike and it shouldn't be, but it's because no one dares to speak up because if you do, you fuck your own career, basically. That's what you get taught. Um, we're going down a, a, a weird avenue right now. But what I'm just saying is, don't try to become a pro player because you think it is the greatest thing you will ever do in your life. If you are fucking sick, if you are one of the guys uh, playing a major, like uh, right, right now, uh, you're loaded as fuck, you can get uh, women, you stay in nice hotels, uh, stuff like this. Um... But even if you go pro and you're not one of those guys, it's possible that you are going to get absolutely screwed over uh, contract-wise with things. Um, there are con like organizations out there right now having uh, some of the most lucrative talent um, in the world on very small contracts. Think something like less than 1,000 euros a month and three-year contracts. Um, don't take that as 100%, but I've, I've heard it. Um, and, and, and from good sources. And, and it's like, um, if you want to go pro in CS, I'm not going to tell you not to, because it is amazing. And I love competing and I love Counter-Strike. And if you love competing and love Counter-Strike, um, it is a career path you can take. And if you work hard, you can go there. But at the same time, what I need you guys to kind of listen to is that um, a lot of the time, Counter-Strike sucks. And when I was on the come up, um because now we've gone through the, the my career sort of right um all the way before uh these teams all the way before this i joined a team i practiced with them for a month this was not an organization and um we were supposed to have a LAN, and literally the day before the LAN, they told me hey um we found someone else and I had another land uh, in Mag Magistra here in the middle of uh, August um, where a day before the land, a, a player on my team says, yeah, I don't want to play here anymore. And it's these are things that will really, really be tough to deal with. Um, imagine if my career would have stopped before it even started because people were telling me I was not good enough. Um, and funnily enough, I ended up having a better career than all of them. And even back then, I remember thinking, how are they going to kick me from this team when I'm the best player on the team? Um, but I had a million times here was about to give up. Um, there was this, uh, yeah, what was it even uh, where we, we found it? Was it eFuture or, or something where we played uh, Ecstatus? Uh, maybe it was even in, in this match, I think, where Frozen, it might be this one. Um, at least we lost. No, I, we didn't lose this one, sorry. They, I have a match where I played against Ecstatus. Um, maybe it was even in Sprout. I have no idea. Um, but where Frozen was just so much better. Like, uh, 
I don't know, at least here, for example, we lost to Frozen, and at this moment, it's in uh, 2018, right? He is now 21 years old. Like, the guy was 15 years old, and and I would have been then 21 years old. Like, I was six years older than this guy. And, and I remember after a match like this, I'm thinking, how can I ever become something in this game when a guy who's six years younger than me is still, like, already now better than me? Um... And I mean, Frozen went on to, again, be one of the most accomplished players. So it makes sense, right? Well, he's not the mo one of the most accomplished players, but like he's one of the biggest talents in the world and, and whatever. He's playing for FaZe, right? In the, at the age of 21 and, and has really good stats. Um, but the point is, for me to go pro, it had so much less to do with... Um, well, a big part of the reason why I went pro was because I worked hard for it, goal-oriented, I found teammates that were like-minded, and I just grinded hard, right? Um, and I grinded smart as well. It was not 14-hour days. It was maybe 8-hour days, but with high quality. Um, that was part of the reason why I became pro. But there were like at least 10 times before I even went pro where I wanted to quit the game because I thought I was not good enough. Um, these times when Trick didn't give me the opportunity... Um, I was thinking like, okay, if these guys are not going to give me the opportunity when I'm playing like this, I literally cannot play better. Like, if they don't give it to me now, either my form is going to drop off, or it just means that I'm not ever going to get that chance. Um, and uh, still, I ended up pro. But there will be a million setbacks on the way to going pro. And even when you are pro, if you're not in a top organization the likelihood of you getting screwed over by an organization or by a teammate or by a friend is 90%, um, I want to say. I don't think anyone in CS has had a smooth career. Even these players that we're looking at, even Frozen, there has been times, uh, and I think I know it as well, where he has been about to be kicked from his teams. Um, I think not, not, not anything remotely recently, but, but back in the day, I've heard at least that he was on his way out of teams and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say anything about uh, reasons because uh, it, it the reason doesn't matter the the res the the important thing at least uh, is and even it, it's not about frozen the point is just any player who made it to the top has had a time where they have doubted themselves they have had a time where someone has screwed them over or they've had a setback in their career and you have to be able to understand this is part of the job Part of the job is when you don't want to travel anymore to tournaments, you have to do it. Part of the job is when you don't like doing social media, you just like playing Counter-Strike. Well, you still have to do social media, you still have to do interviews, you still have to do media days. Um, part of the job is uh, you can never plan something. You can't go to family uh, vacations. Uh, you can't... Uh, you can't uh, someone invites you to a wedding six months in the future, you can't even say yes. You can't say yes if they invite you a week before because you don't even know. Maybe you get an invite to a tournament because someone drops off. Who knows? This is all part of the job. And that's not even touching um, the bad stuff like getting screwed over by a contract or getting backstabbed by your teammates, stuff like this, um, which is a part of it. And the reason why it's a part of it is because CS is still so young. Um, if this was football, well, the best players would be sort of drafted, right? They would be found early on in their youth careers and they would be uh, slowly um, introduced to a professional working environment and the people who decide sort of if they live or die as a football player are people who are their coaches. Whereas when you're coming up in Counter-Strike, the people who decide if you live or die as a Counter-Strike player are your teammates. And they can be jealous, they can be a million things, they can remove you because you are the best player on the team and they want to be the star. Hell, I've probably done it when I was younger, removed people from my team uh, because I argued that they were playing for stats when in reality they were just more in the spotlight than me and, and in a way uh, I wanted to be the best player on the team because if I was the best player on the team it was more likely I was the one in the spotlight. Um, CS is immature and... Um, while I've had so many great moments and I have so much to thank for Counter-Strike, I don't want people to think this is like some rant saying, oh, I wish I would have done things differently and stuff. I love Counter-Strike and I am happy with where I've ended up in life. I'm happy with my life. Um, but 
people don't understand how tough it is um, from the outside. They just see the big salaries and the fancy cars and the, and the nice hotels and stuff, but it goes so much deeper than that. And I want people here in the academy and also anyone watching the video to understand that it is not easy to become pro, but you have to go through so much shit on the way as well, like um, every player does. And uh, like, it's a part of it. You gotta you gotta be pre prepared for it if you wanna go pro. And if I've scared you off, then probably you are not gonna go pro anyway. Uh, if I haven't scared you off, then you just now know it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, yeah. I think in professional sports, to be fair, I'm also just gonna say this: it, this happens more than you probably think. Like I have a few friends who actually went pro in like different sports, football and tennis. It happens more than you think that they get fucked over. Like. Yeah. Not necessarily when they're actually like playing for like a Bundesliga club or something like that, right? But mm. when you're like on the come up in like the smaller club, sometimes some sponsor just pulls out and the club can't pay you. Like it's it, it does happen not necessarily because of the clubs, but because of circumstances surrounding the clubs. But also a coach a coach in an academy in football has fair rates as well. So it's like, yeah, of course, it is what it is, right? Like you just got to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. and and. Was that Oh, sorry. Can I just make one thought real yeah, yeah, quick yeah. before? I, yeah. With that, right? This is the perfect example. You tell me now that in football and in other sports, this also is going on. And I am ignorant to this. I'm solely focusing on the Counter-Strike aspect because I know for sure this is happening in Counter-Strike, right? But I don't know that it happens in, in football and in tennis and stuff like this, but it does not surprise me. But because I'm only looking at it from the outside, I'm seeing also all these footballers, but at the same time, I'm seeing these footballers like uh, whatever Mario Balotelli, uh, you know, uh, one day uh, giving food to homeless and the other uh, time setting off fireworks in his uh, hotel room or footballers who punch someone at a nightclub, uh, footballers who, uh, I mean, there's a guy right now, uh, it's a big story in the Netherlands, right, uh, Quincy Promus, who stabbed someone, I think he killed him, and then he basically went to uh russia to play for a russian club because they don't have extradition with the netherlands and then he's hiding there but now he went to dubai and he hit someone with his car and he drove off and now he's gonna go to court in in dubai and the netherlands is trying to get him extradited from dubai to the netherlands um so of course like there's so much stuff but we just don't know it because we're not in it and you guys are not in it in counter-strike that's why i have to tell you but it's really good to have your perspective on it that this happens in any any sport, and I bet you at a at a regular job it happens as well to some extent. The, the, the thing in just like obviously in like actual like tier one professional football, for example, like soccer, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's so much money in the skin and skin in the game that typically the sponsors and the companies and stuff are so big that they are very professional, obviously, yeah. right? Like Manchester United is more professional than like Astralis are, right? Yeah. Um, but it's more like, especially when you get into like the first division, second division teams. Sometimes you know the local, like national chain, like just it's like actually no, and then you don't have any money, um, and that can like happen sometimes. Uh, doesn't that, like, and the main thing is also like in a game like Counter Strike, this also happens like in the. This happens also because, like, the system of Counter Strike, like the tournament system instead of like the franchise system as well, and like the way you come up, right? Whereas, yeah. like, in, in football, it's, a, like, a league system. It's, it works, it, like, it just functions differently. And it's not yeah. so much, like, on a month-to-month -month basis. It's more like you're not playing different tournaments. You're just playing a league kind of situation. Yeah. Um, yes, sorry. I'm, I'm kind of not going to answer that. I It's more like I, I feel like I interrupted someone before, and I'm not actually sure who I interrupted, but I want him or, oh, her, or they or them oh, to yeah, be was... heard. <laughs> I know, I was just going to say, it's like, um, you were saying there's all this, um, there's a lot more that goes into being a pro than just, you know, playing Counter-Strike and traveling around the world and doing all these things. But I guess it's, it boils down to really, if you can put up with that other side and if being like on top of a competitive level and being so competitive in the game that you love to play, it's, if, if you love that enough that you can stick through it and even if they're setbacks, you can keep working on yourself and just enjoy that team play and that competitiveness inside of you. It really pushes you through. I feel like that's another good thing that can like propel you in like dark times, say that you have, and I'm sure that everyone else has as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, you're completely right. Like it's uh, there go there's so much more that goes to it. I mean, I could spend you know five hours talking about this easily, and I could go more in detail with my depression, and I I would probably also have some helpful stuff to say to people. Um, people can reach out to me on Twitter as well if they you know are struggling with dep- depression or if did they have a question about just anything. Um, I'm pretty. I'm not always the best at answering, but. Um, yeah, if you don't DM me, but if you write me publicly on Twitter, I will, I will answer. Um, Can I ask you a question? If it's quick, because I have to wake up in less than seven hours. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, you went pro back in like 2016, like 17-ish, right? Yeah, 18 um, was my like pro pro yeah, contract. But like yeah. you were you were you were in like in a more similar stage of your career to like me in 2016, 2017, right? Yeah. And the main thing is like. I just want to ask, like, obviously today there seems to be a very heavy focus on, like, ESCA is, like, the main way to go pro, right? Like, get mm-hmm. up into, like, main advanced, like, even ECL and shit like that. Like, yeah. that's one of the big ways to go pro. It's obviously very consistent if you're really good, right? Um, like, do you think that's, like, for example, for me, when I go, like, I don't really care too much. I think people focus a bit too much on face it. But, like, do you think... Like just focusing on ECA and finding teams for ECA seasons and kind of centering your, I wouldn't say progress, but you know, like using that as like your main way to go pro is like a good idea. Yeah. Like, just play, play, play team series, play leagues, play tournaments, and, and get uh, get uh, your experience this way. It will help you so much. It's uh, it's my top tip. Sir. Sure. Yeah. Like even also, it's so great because it's easy to track your progress as a team. If you are like starting out in, for example, ECA Open or something like that, next season you're intermediate. Next season maybe you're stuck at intermediate, then you go to main. Um, that's how it was for me. Like I won Open and I went to, I think even just intermediate. I don't think you could go directly to main. And then I had to play through intermediate to even get to main. And then, you know, I worked my way up. So I suggest you guys do the same. Um, I will do some sort of an outro on the video. I'll actually just say thank you for watching, whoever is on the YouTube video. And then uh, I will uh, also thank you guys who are here. So thank you for watching the YouTube video, guys. Bye-bye.